Hello and welcome to Curator with a Camera. I'm Anthony Cools, Senior Curator of Rail Transport and Technology at the National Railway Museum. And today, we're going to have a look at one of my favourites, the Duchess of Hamilton. In the 1930s, the London Midland and Scottish Railway were running crack express trains from London to Glasgow. They created the princess class locomotives, names such as Princess Elizabeth, Princess Margaret Rose. These engines could run hard, they could run uphill, they could run fast. But the LMS needed more. William Stanier, the chief engineer, suggested that more of these princess class locomotives were built. But his chief draftsman, Tom Coleman, had other ideas. So what Coleman did, with a free hand and the drawing board, he created a design of a locomotive that extended every inch of locomotive into what became the Princess Coronation class, otherwise known to enthusiasts and fans as the Duchess. I first saw the Duchess in 1980. I was six and I fell in love. You can't tell my wife there are two ladies in my life, but she knows about the Duchess, it's okay. But why does it get this look that it has, this streamlined, bulbous look to it? Some people love it, some people hate it, some people think it's a bit like Marmite. Some folks refer to it as an upturned bathtub. Well, I suppose it does look a little bit like that. Coleman's initial design of an enhanced princess class, the princess coronation as these became, saw an engine that looked conventional. It had a smoke box, it had a chimney, it had a dome and a running plate and splashes, everything that was visible in a classic 1930s steam loco. But over on the east coast of England, the l &E &R publicity team were fating and getting very excited with their new streamliners, the Silver Jubilee, the Silver Link, all the, the Gresley A4s with that iconic look. And the LMS publicity team said, we want a part of that. And so Coleman had the challenge that he had to come up with packing streamlining on top of the existing design of locomotive. But Coleman and the team pulled the rabbit out of the hat. They came up with this design and in wind tunnel tests, it worked very well. And uh, it was meant to be the absolute wonder of the age. The Duchess is a very complicated front end. I'm not a particularly technical person, but these are called compound curves. You get one curve comes around one way and another curve comes around the top and you get this incredible dome shape, which I think is the crowning glory of the Princess Coronation. So it gives this engine a really special look. You can see here, this Art Deco styling even extends to the headlamps. Isn't that fantastic? And this is real gold leaf. And you can see how much of this engine and its body is covered in gold leaf. If you're into statistics and you really want something to tell people at parties, there is a mile of gold leaf on the body of this loco. This was the epitome of motive power for the London to Glasgow service. The streamlining gave it a status that set it apart from every other locomotive in the land. Now, Duchess of Hamilton isn't just a machine designed to look good, it's designed to do a job. And that's pulled trains from London to Glasgow and vice versa. So how does it do it? It's got four cylinders, all hiding underneath the streamlining, but there is, there is one there, the left-hand cylinder, there's one on the right, and then there are two inside cylinders driving onto this first axle through a, a crank axle. And there's a nice little bit of proof that it's always nice to see. Uh, the stamping of the engine there, the stamping of the engine number 6229, that proves that this part is actually off the Duchess. There was a lot of interchangeability of parts of locos throughout their working lives. And every so often we come across people who say, oh, well, you know, uh, it's not really X, Y, or Z because all these the parts bear different numbers. So there's, another stamping there, uh, 6229. So we know that 
definitely is there. And uh, 6229. I'm almost on the lookout for something that says 6234 or something. And there will be, there will be. There'll be parts that were fitted to other engines. With driving wheels of over six feet in diameter, the engine wasn't just able to put power down on the track, it was able to run fast. This engine was putting down the equivalent of 3,000 horsepower, a figure that was unmatched until much later in the diesel era in the 1960s and 70s. Duchess of Hamilton wasn't necessarily the record breaker herself, but the very first engine of the class, Coronation number 6220, was for a time the fastest steam locomotive in the world. And she's still accelerating, faster yet and faster. 102, 105, 108, and Coronation has done it. 114 miles an hour, the highest speed yet attained in the Empire. The steaming rate of the boiler was so immense that it was impossible for two firemen to keep up with the demand for coal that this engine required. It has what's called Valschart's valve gear on the outside and a very polished uh, bearing cap on the return crank there, really quite nice. And then, but of course, Speed Demon, it's fitted with a Smith speedometer there, which is connected through a cable to a dial in the cab. And then down here, we see the, uh, oh, there's the film crew. Hi guys. <laughs> and me as well. Gosh, I could shave in the uh, reflection of this loco. And that, that, there behind us, that's quite a nice uh, juxtaposition there is with Mallard. Uh, some would say the great rival to uh, the Stanier Pacific here. And, um, but here we are, the brass works plate for our Duchess built at Crewe, 1938. There's the washout plugs for the boiler and the firebox are all set on the side there. And then these hatches along the side covering oil place, oiling positions and these round cast lids for the sandboxes. Whilst it does the job, it's not very practical. A steam locomotive needs attention all the time, whether it's in the operation of it on the footplate from the driver and fireman, or at locomotive sheds where it's being serviced, where it's getting cold and watered. But what you can see here is there's nowhere to stand on the outside. There's a handrail, that's great but it's really impractical. You have to have a ladder put up on the side of the engine and then fastened so that you've still got point of contact with something that means you're not gonna fall off. And that's all very well in the 30s when it's boom and lots of PR, but 1939, the world changed forever with the outbreak of the Second World War. And this is incredibly impractical in a wartime locomotive. You know, all the bits that you need to get to are hidden away. There's a program of taking the streamlining off the Princess Coronations. And they begin to look more like a conventional locomotive. But the streamlining gave the Duchess another day in the sun. The LMS were invited in 1939 to send a locomotive and train to the World's Fair in the USA. And they wanted Coronation, but Coronation couldn't make it initially. So for a time, this engine carried the number 6220, it carried the name Coronation, and it went over to the States. What also happened as part of the uh, American tour was that the engine had to be made fit to operate on the American railways. So it's got a big headlamp that gets fitted to the front of it, but it also has this amazing little thing here, a bell, an audible warning that every locomotive on US railroads wore. So not just a whistle as an audible warning, but a very, very loud bell. And you hear that resonance, it goes on for ages. But I think it's time that we walked up into the cab and had a look and see what made this thing go. Well, we've scaled the heady heights and got into the cab of the Duchess. You know, the engine was a glamorous thing 
on the outside. It was the star of all the publicity of the LMS. But up here on the footplate, in the cab, it's a world apart from that glorious Art Deco, from the streamlining, from the gold leaf. This is the world of work. This is where we meet Duchess of Hamilton, the powerhouse, head on. It's a bruiser, this engine. It's not designed ergonomically. There's no creature comforts for the crew. And look, the, uh, the driver, if he gets to have a sit down, he has a wooden seat, just a flip up plank. So what are we looking at here? It's basically the controls of a simple steam engine. There's all the parts that you would expect. There's the reverser, which is a rotary one, turning for forward and reverse. We've got it locked at the moment so that people don't fiddle with it and get their fingers trapped. And then we've got the regulator, which controls the amount of steam to the cylinders. Now, it's a simple up and down. And this, is, this, this has 250 pounds of steam behind it quite often. And I have seen a driver or several drivers on this engine. It's so hard in this that they've actually put their shoulder underneath the regulator and pushed it up there because they haven't got enough strength in their arms. They've just gone Whoa! to get it up into full position so that the engine is able to work to its fullest potential. So it's like the on-off switch, really. Elsewhere, what else have we got? We've got the uh, water gauge glasses, one on either side. Tells you how much water there is in the boiler. Two steam valves for the injectors, which uh, are there to, uh, to control how much water you're putting in to the boiler from the tender behind us, because of course a steam engine is a very, very thirsty machine. But you can also see how frustration was taken out on these things. The injectors could sometimes be a little bit recalcitrant. And here you see this casting of this, this valve wheel should be straight down, but it's bent. And that shows a sign that somebody's got very frustrated with it, or not just one person, but several people have been very frustrated over several decades, and they belted it to make sure that it's exactly, it does what they want it to do. It might have been stuck shut like that, and then the valve can't open, so they've hit it. If it hasn't hit it, worked hitting it with a the hand, they've then got a coal pick or, so, or a spanner and just gone clank. And most steam locos that have any signs of a long working life will have signs of wear. And you can see here, likewise, on the, uh, on the piping where things have been hit, there's been abrasions and stuff has got uh, dents and dings in it. One of the most important bits that everybody loves with a steam loco is the whistle. And because this engine's so big, you don't have a whistle chain like a lot of the older ones. You've just got a valve that is depressed there and comes out with the very distinctive sound of what people call the Stania Hooter. It's a very low note. One thing that this engine has, which none of the other locos in the collection have, is, uh, is a coal pusher though. We talked about the voracious appetite of this engine and its need to keep that firebox, the grate in there, covered with coal at all times. Now, that's quite easy-ish when an engine is at the beginning of its run because in the tender here, the coal is right up close on what's called the shovel plate. It's dead easy to move from the shoveling plate here, round, there's Lee's feet, through to the firebox. But as the journey carries on, the fireman is having to go back into the tender to bring coal physically forward. So Stanier and Coleman come up with this creation in the back here. This is a coal pusher. It has a steam cylinder at the back and then a big ram here at the front. And through operating the valve at the, at the top of the cab, that ram, that pusher, is then operated by steam and pushes the coal further forward in the tender. The Duchess Pacific was an absolute crown in the locomotive annals of the London Midland and Scottish Railway. And whilst Sir William Stanier is widely credited at being the chief engineer 
who oversaw this engine. It was the chief draftsman, Tom Coleman, and his team who put it together and gave it such a look of a 1930s design icon. Thanks for joining us for Curator with a Camera. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have with this engine having been a personal favorite since I was a kid. If you have, then why not leave us with a like or even subscribe so you can look out for future episodes of Curator with a Camera.